This is Hidden Killers Week in Review. A look back at the most prolific stories of the week. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruski. Featuring defense attorney, Hidden Killers daily contributor, and host of the Defense Diaries podcast, Bob Motta. Well, we have heard from Judge Gull in the Delphi murder case and what her thoughts are on how everything has been transpiring from the closed-door meetings to the dismissal of the attorneys of Richard Allen and someone who's been following this extremely closely from the beginning, Bob Mata, defense attorney. Thank you for joining us. Bob, what's your take on all of the documents that have recently dropped from Judge Gull's response and where this is all headed now? Oh, man. I mean, it seems like we say this like every time we chat that it's like the case that never sleeps. Like I just never, I mean, like it's just constant filings with this thing. So as you stated, we did get the response. Oh, we got two responses actually yesterday, the attorney general and then Gull. I was obviously more interested in seeing Gull's, but it was funny because the attorney general's response actually dropped first. So I was like, wow, this is interesting. I'm like, did the attorney general decide to step in here? Mm-hmm. And like, you know, because we had heard originally that the attorney general wasn't going to respond yeah. on behalf of the judge. So I was a little taken back by that. And I'm like halfway reading through that thing. And I get an email that Gull's response had dropped. So yeah. drop the AG's thing, jump right into Gull's thing, start reading through it. And, you know, I mean, it's as far as her position as to the merits and there and there's two primary arguments there. The first argument, which, frankly, if the Supreme Court is going to go by the law, she'll probably win it. Mm -hmm. And, And that which will mean because she's saying that procedurally that there's a something they call a a condition precedent, meaning that. In order for them to have gone to the Supreme Court of Indiana, that what they should have done, what they're required to do, is that they have to do what's called an interlocutory appeal. Okay. Okay. So that they have to go try to appeal the decision regarding her not allowing them to enter their pro bono appearances on the 31st of October, because that was essentially the day that they were removed. I, I know that everybody likes to talk about the the nineteenth when she claims that they both withdrew, and you know it's questionable whether or not Rosie did it all. I like he clearly did not. He didn't do it orally, and he didn't file a motion. So it was like a, I guess, a de facto withdrawal, but it wasn't by the book by any stretch. Sure. So you know, for all intents and purposes, I still thought he was in the case. So I, I've always considered ten thirty one to be the day where they entered their pro bono appearances, and she looked at Richard Allen and said, "Sorry, in good conscience, I can't allow these two guys to continue on as your defense attorneys. I think they're both incompetent, and I think that they've been grossly negligent with the representation of you." <clears throat> so. That's kind of the issue, the germane issue. So what the argument that they made primarily, her and her attorney, is that procedurally they have to file that interlocutory appeal at the appellate court level, get denied by them. And then, and only then, if that remedy, if you've exhausted all your other outlets, all your other potential ways to get a remedy, which in this case would be an an interlocutory appeal, now, there, there's some question of whether or not that issue in particular of whether or not she had the ability to be able to to deny them entering their appearance can even be brought up in an interlocutory appeal. But for the purposes of filing it and getting denied, it doesn't matter if it's getting denied if the if the appellate court's like, we don't handle this issue. Mm-hmm. Like that would have been sufficient because then that means that the last resort is going up to SCOIN, going up to the Supreme Court of Indiana. And so that would have taken away that argument from them. And, you know, anytime you're reading a document like that, and I did a YouTube live on it, I always do when they drop documents, which our listeners should probably check out if they're wanting to get the nuts and bolts of these documents. I really, you know, Allison and I do real deep dives on them, typically read the whole thing. But, you know, in that case, it would have removed that initial argument, which again, in, in that type of a document, you're always going to have your most, most powerful argument first. So that's what she led with. 
So if the Supreme Court decides that they agree that they did have a remedy, that their remedy should have been to go to the appellate court first, get denied there, and then come to us, they can deny it without getting to the merits, which is all the stuff that we, we've we been talking about, all the you know, the leak and, you know, does that stuff reach gross negligence? Was there due process? Like all those issues, which are the merits of the case, the Supreme Court doesn't have to decide any of that because they're saying we can't even get to the merits because it's defective. Your pleading was defective procedurally. So unfortunately, we're dismissing it because it's procedurally defective. And now we don't have to answer any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day. So, and (sighs) You know, we talked about it last week, man. You know, the politics of it. I mean, it could, if they follow the law and they don't buy the argument, because like Kara Weineke, who was one of the primary drafters of that second original action, you know, I had her on our YouTube and like after she had filed. Yeah. You know, and I asked her flat out, I'm like, what do you think your chances are? Because they had to make the argument. They knew that rule. You know what I mean? That they didn't just skip the appellate court willy nilly, not understanding the law. They understood it and they put their reasoning and why they skipped that step in their argument. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court, if they find that to be compelling, that that relief really wasn't available to them, that the appellate, the interlocutory appeal was not available to them, then they might survive that portion. If they survive that portion, then we get to the meat. Then we get to the good stuff and we'll see where they come down on it. But Karen, like when I asked Kara, she was like, you know, I don't know. Like they just don't grant writs like this very often. It's a, it really is an extraordinary relief and it doesn't happen very often. So I wouldn't have called her like overly optimistic. You know what I mean? I I think that she felt, I wouldn't even say she was guardedly optimistic. I I'd say she was a bit pessimistic, but realist. You know, I mean, she understands it's it's like it's a tough thing to get the Supreme Court to do, especially no matter what we think of Judge Gull's performance on this particular case. She's been on the bench a long time. You know, I, I think up until this point, she's been pretty well respected. And, you know, she's made three different attempts to get on the Supreme Court herself. So, you know, I mean, I, I, and these are fellow judges. Yes, they're at a higher level, but they're also you know, part of the judiciary and they sit on the bench. You know, I I don't know that they'll be like chomping at the bit to blast one of their colleagues. You know what I mean? So I I think that there's a a high, a very high likelihood that if they can find an easy way out Mm -hmm. where they don't have to even get to the merits, where they don't have to say, go, you screwed this up. Yeah. You know, where they can say, look, you know, you didn't follow the rules here. You should have filed the interlocutory appeal. And by way of that, we're dismissing the matter. And then they're in the clear. I think they might take it. You know, that's just what my gut's telling me. I hope it doesn't play out that way because I I really think that it's important that these two guys finish this case out for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. You know, but like the least of which being that, you know, I want them to finish it for that for their own good. I, I, I the most of which being, I want them to finish it because that's who the defendant wants is his attorneys. Sure, you know, it's about it's his Sixth Amendment rights, it's his constitutional rights that are at stake. So, yeah. yeah so that's kind of that was my initial blush on that thing. Want to listen ad free? Want advanced access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.